Alyssa Milano leads a campaign against sex in order to fight Georgia's pro-life law. Harvard punishes an academic for defending Harvey Weinstein and Democrats move closer to impeachment. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Well, I hope you all had a wonderful weekend. I know I did. So we will talk about all of the things in the news in just a second. First, hiring used to be hard. Multiple job sites, stacks of resumes, a confusing review process. But today, hiring can be easy. You only have to go to one place to get it done. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter sends your jobs to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and then invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one, spotlights the top candidates, so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the very first day. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. You want to up your game? You want your hires to be better? You want to make sure you have the best employees? There's only one way to do it, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. There is a reason we use ZipRecruiter every time we look to make a new hire over at Daily Wire. Check them out right now. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Okay, so... The left has decided that the end of the world is nigh in Georgia, according to some of the world's best journalists. Apparently, Georgia's new heartbeat bill, which protects the lives of the unborn, you know, unborn children, human lives, that bill, barbaric, dark ages, terrible, not only barbaric and dark ages and terrible, according to some of these brilliant folks, but apparently leads to the possibility that women will be prosecuted if they have a miscarriage in Georgia. It will be the end of the world, cats and dogs sleeping together, all the rest of this crap. Okay, here's the reality. The bill does no such thing. David French has a great piece over at National Review explaining the legality behind the Georgia law. He points out that the law not only bans abortion when the baby has a detectable human heartbeat, it declares the scientific, philosophical, and theological truth that an unborn child is a natural person under state law. In fact, the law even goes so far as to ensure that a guy who knocks up a woman has to provide child support for her pregnancy. French points out, he says, I expected activist resistance and protest against the bill. I expected radical voices to urge corporate boycotts of Georgia. I must confess, I did not expect to see a series of stories with lurid headlines and fundamentally mistaken premises go viral and stay viral for days. Here is a sampling. Georgia, uh, Slate, Georgia just criminalized abortion. Women who terminate their pregnancies would receive life in prison. The weak, Georgia's heartbeat abortion bill could imprison women for life. All of this is garbage. All of it is untrue. All of it is slanted news and fake news and stupidity and biased, okay? Because here is the truth. This is not what the law says. The stories are viral because they rely, says French, on facially plausible reasoning. Since Georgia declared all unborn children to be natural persons, then Georgia's conventional murder statute must apply to women who self-terminate. But this is fundamentally wrong. The heartbeat bill did not repeal a number of Georgia criminal statutes that explicitly apply to abortions and unborn children, and it does not overrule controlling legal authority, holding that these statutes bar prosecution of a woman for terminating her own pregnancy. It is not the pro-life position, nor has it been, as far as I'm aware, ever, that women who self-terminate pregnancies ought to be prosecuted. This is simply not a pro-life position. Donald Trump, you'll recall, in 2016, made implications that he might want to prosecute women who did this, and the entire pro-life movement came down on his head. So when folks on the left, people on the social left, journalists who lie, say things like this bill is going to criminalize women who self-terminate or who have miscarriages, like accidental miscarriages, it is just not true. First, as French points out, there is a specific code section that applies to unlawful abortions. Georgia Code Section 1612-140 states, quote, a person commits the offense of criminal abortion when, in violation of Code Section 1612-141, he or she administers any medicine, drugs, or other substance, whatever, to any woman, or when he or she uses any instrument or other means, whatever, upon any woman with intent to produce a miscarriage or abortion. A person convicted of the offense of criminal abortion shall be punished by imprisonment for not less than one, nor more than 10 years. Code Section 1612-141 is the exact section that was amended to include the heartbeat provision. If a person performs an abortion in violation of the heartbeat bill, then Code Section 1612-140 applies. It does not impose life imprisonment on anybody. Georgia courts have held it does not apply to a woman who self-terminates only to third parties who perform an abortion, which again is the traditional pro-life position, but people who don't know anything say differently because they are liars. In Hillman v. State, the Court of Appeals of Georgia rejected the prosecution's efforts to imprison a woman who shot herself in the stomach to kill her unborn child. Interpreting 1612-140, it said, quote, 
This statute is written in the third person, clearly indicating that at least two actors must be involved. Accordingly, it does not criminalize a pregnant woman's actions in securing an abortion, regardless of the means utilized. Second, second, the Georgia Code section that criminalizes feticide, such as when a man attacks a woman for purpose of killing her unborn baby, specifically says, quote, nothing in this code section shall be construed to permit the prosecution of any woman with respect to her unborn child. Taken together, these statutes mean that a woman cannot be prosecuted either for aborting her own baby or committing feticide. If you're still skeptical about my argument, perhaps you'll believe a Planned Parenthood representative responding to a query from the Washington Post. The Post fact check claims that the Georgia bill criminalized women who terminated their own pregnancies and found those claims incorrect. There's a quote from the Washington Post, quote, the news headlines and social media headlines that speculate about the bill's unintended consequences are, at the very least, not productive. At most, they're harmful. This is according to Planned Parenthood's Stacey Fox. HB 481 could not be used to successfully prosecute women, she argued. She says if a woman had a miscarriage, she could be pulled into an investigation looking at whether someone had performed an illegal abortion on her. But again, that is not for purposes of prosecuting the woman, nor is the suggestion that a woman could be jailed for a miscarriage. That's a bunch of crap put out by badly motivated people who are liars. That's a far, far cry from the headlines above, says David French. But the truth isn't stopping the falsehood from rocketing around social media. Okay, so with that in mind, it is important to see how the left has responded to the lie, how they, how they push the lie, how they exacerbate the lie, and then how they, on the back of this, use the woke lie in order to promote some of the dumbest boycott policy I have, hap I have ever seen in my life. So first, you're seeing corporations saying that they're going to boycott Georgia. They won't film in Georgia. Well, I'm sure that that's going to change the lives of pro-lifers. I'm sure that all the pro-lifers in the state of Georgia will suddenly be okay with the killing of the unborn, so long as you guys don't bring your production of Hangover Part 4 to Georgia. It's going to change everything, guys. But according to NBC News, Hollywood, it just shows you where Hollywood is, that they really care deeply about abortion. Abortion is the Hollywood uh, litmus test. There are two litmus tests for morality in Hollywood. One, are you okay with killing unborn children? And two, how do you feel about same-sex marriage? Now, it used to be that same-sex marriage was really the only test. You could be pro-life in Hollywood, sort of. But the fact is, you're not really allowed to be pro-life anymore. If you're pro-life in Hollywood, this is a symptom of you being a crazed religious fanatic. Or as Chris Cuomo, the very objective journalist on CNN, has said, the only reason to be pro-life is faith and feelings, which is utter crap and garbage, obviously. Well, when it comes to Hollywood, I mean, I remember I, I, I did a book called Primetime Propaganda. This is back in 2013, 2014, 2012, maybe. In any case, my book was about Hollywood and how Hollywood is biased against conservatives. One of the people I interviewed for the book was Patricia Heaton. Patty Heaton has been the star of multiple sitcoms. She was the star of Everybody Loves Raymond. She played Raymond's wife. She was the star of The Middle. She, she's been a consistent fixture on television for years. And I, I remember I interviewed her and because Patty is deeply pro-life. She's Catholic and she is deeply pro-life. And I asked her, do you feel that you've ever lost a job because of your pro-life position? And she said, no, I've been working consistently in town for 20 years. And she said, can I call you back? Two days later, I received a call from Patty. And she said, I've been calling around. I called my agent. I called a bunch of people. They never told me this, but I've lost seven specific jobs due to being pro-life. One of the litmus tests in Hollywood is whether you're in favor of the quote-unquote right of a woman to kill an unborn child and have an abortion doctor do it. Right? This is one of the moral questions of the day because morality in Hollywood is completely upside down. If you wish to raise your child religious, evil. If you wish to kill your child in the womb, good. That's the basic logical morality of, of Hollywood, unfortunately. So now, Hollywood is declaring that it's going to boycott Georgia. It's funny, I don't remember Hollywood boycotting Hollywood after Harvey Weinstein. I don't remember Hollywood boycotting Hollywood after Oscar is so white. I don't remember any of this stuff. But I do remember Hollywood trying to boycott the state of Georgia. Okay, so according to NBC News, multiple production companies have announced they will no longer film in Georgia after the state passed a restrictive abortion law. The law, signed by Governor Brian Kemp, a Republican on Tuesday, bans abortion once a fetal heartbeat can be detected, which can be as early as six weeks before some women even know they are pregnant. Georgia has quietly become a major production location for film and television, largely because of tax incentives the state offers. In 2016, according to the nonprofit Film LA, 17 of the year's top 100 films were produced in Georgia, more than in California, because it turns out that Democrats in California don't like the economic policies that they vote for. So they vote for these crap economic policies in my home state, and then they can't stand the heat, and so they get out of the kitchen and they go to Georgia. Kemp said, this year the industry employs around 200,000 Georgians and brings in tens of billions of dollars of revenue to the state. David Simon, who's the creator of The Wire and a far leftist, said his production company will cease filming in the state 
He tweeted, quote, our comparative assessments of locations for upcoming development will pull Georgia off the list until we can be assured the health options and civil liberties of our female colleagues are unimpaired. If you truly believe that Georgia is going to change its abortion policy because frickin' David Simon ain't going to film there, I don't think you understand pro-life people. For pro-life people, this bill is the equivalent of the abolition of slavery. And if you think that those people are going to be like, yeah, you know what, let's go back to the killing of babies because I desperately need David Simon's latest TV show here. Think again. Mark Duplass, a delightful fellow whom I, per whom I personally know, tweeted, quote, don't give your business to Georgia and asked other producers to join him. He says, will you pledge with me not to film anything in Georgia until they reverse this backwards legislation? Well, I pledge that I won't watch any of your overrated films, Mark Duplass. Mark Duplass, by the way, is a, is a truly cowardly individual. I mean, <laughs> a truly cowardly individual. I'll tell you a Mark Duplass story in just one second, because we have a really good Mark Duplass story here at The Daily Wire. But first, for decades, credit cards have been telling us to buy it now and pay for it later with interest. Despite your best intentions, that interest can get out of control fast. With Lending Club, you can consolidate your debt or pay off credit cards with one fixed monthly payment. Since 2007, Lending Club has helped millions of people regain control of their finances with affordable fixed rate personal loans. No trips to a bank, no high interest credit cards. Just go to LendingClub.com, tell them about yourself, how much you want to borrow, pick the terms that are right for you. If you are approved, your loan is automatically deposited into your bank account in as little as a few days. Lending Club is the number one peer-to-peer -peer lending platform with over $35 billion in loans issued. Go to LendingClub.com slash Ben. Check your rate in minutes. Borrow up to 40 grand. That is LendingClub.com slash Ben. LendingClub.com slash Ben. All loans made by WebBank member FDIC equal housing lender. Go check it out right now. There is no reason for you to suffer through these incredibly high interest rates. Instead, consolidate your debt, do the responsible financial thing, and make sure that your financial house is in order. An easy way to do that, head over to LendingClub.com slash Ben right now. You can check that rate in minutes. Borrow up to 40 grand. That's LendingClub.com slash Ben. So quick side note before I get to my Mark Duplass story. So the quick side note is this. All these folks in Hollywood who think that they are punishing the state of Georgia by not relocating in Georgia for their filming, you think the people who work on their films in Georgia are by and large the people who voted for Brian Kemp? They're punishing the very people who are allied with their political allies. They're punishing their own political allies in Georgia. But again, political cowardice is, is the nature of the folks in California. They won't stay in California and pay their fair share. Instead, they hijack it to, to they hightail it to Georgia to take advantage of the tax benefits. And then when Georgia doesn't act like California with regard to pro-life laws, then all of a sudden, oh, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go that. Why? Because they're cowards. And not only are they cowards, they're vicious cowards. I haven't seen a lot of conservatives say we're not doing business in New York or California thanks to their immoral abortion laws. They continue to, to recognize that we live in a republic and that it is good to do business with people with whom you disagree because we still have to share this republic. Folks on the left are basically creating a two-track America. Whether they are boycotting North Carolina for trying to preserve gendered bathrooms in state law or whether they are boycotting Georgia in its attempt to boycott, in its attempts to save the lives of, of the unborn. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so here's the Mark Duplass story, which I think tells you what you need to know about the, the moral backbone of Hollywood. So Mark Duplass happens to be a fairly talented guy. He's been on some TV shows. He's produced some films. And Mark Duplass came to our office here at Daily Wire because he wanted to spend some time with me. He reached out to me because he was doing a film on the Second Amendment, and he wanted to make sure that it wasn't biased too far in one direction or the other, so he wanted to know the pro-gun arguments, which is great. So he came in. I gave him about an hour and a half of my time. And as he left, I warned him, dude, do not tweet that you have been here. Because if you tweet that you have been here, your own side will stab you in the back. Like the Night's Watch to John. Like that's, why, that's how this will go. And he did not believe me. About three weeks later, for, for no real reason, he tweets out that I am a well-intentioned fellow, which is a statement with which I happen to agree. I have conversations with folks all the time on the left so, well, so long as they're not badly motivated. I have lots of conversations with people on the left on a regular basis. And Duplass tweets out that I'm a nice guy who is well-motivated. And Duplass then gets hit with a wave, a raft of leftists saying, no, he's the worst person who ever lived. He's so terrible. Duplass not only pulls down the tweet saying that I'm a decent person, he then puts up a new tweet saying that he opposes all forms of racism, sexism, bigotry, and homophobia. So when it comes to woke scolding, Duplass is, is definitely at the top of the list. And the, the cowardice of people who won't have conversations, the cowardice of people who simply decide that because they oppose Georgia's abortion law, they're now boycotting the state, is pretty astonishing. Now, this goes to some pretty insane lengths. And the, the most insane lengths, of course, come courtesy of Alyssa Milano. So Alyssa Milano 
is a pretty untalented actress who, who used to be uncharmed. And she decided that she was going to initiate a recap of Lysistrata. That she was, she was saying that women, feminists, should not have sex with their boyfriends until Georgia repeals its law. So she tweeted out, quote, this is with hashtag sex strike. If your choices are denied, if our choices are denied, so are yours, quote, our reproductive rights are being erased. Until women have legal control over our own bodies, we just cannot risk pregnancy. Join me by not having sex until we get bodily autonomy back. I'm calling for a sex strike. Pass it on. So a few things about this, because it's pretty freaking great. A few things about this. First of all, I assume Melissa Milano's boyfriend or husband, is she married? I think she's married. I assume that her husband agrees with her on politics. So she's now telling her woke husband she will not sleep with him because she's mad at Brian Kemp in Georgia. First of all, if you're in the boudoir and your girl is bringing up Brian Kemp in Georgia, you got a problem. You got a problem. Second of all, I, I love that the left is now through a backdoor method, rediscovering traditional morality. So Elizabeth Milano tweets, we can, love and sa- we can love sex and fight for our bodily autonomy. There are lots of alternatives to cis men. Protect your vaginas, ladies. Men in positions of power are trying to legislate them. Hashtag sex strike. So I'm confused. First of all, babies grow in uteruses, not in vaginas. Second of all, I don't know how you legislate a vagina. Very weird. I don't know. What would that legislation look like? Section 10B8, vagina. What what, what do you legislate a vagina? And then my favorite here is that she says, we can, you can, so you can continue to have sex, just not with a cis man. So you can have sex with a transgender man, I guess. So a woman, a bodily woman who says she is a man, you can have sex with or with another woman. But I was informed by the woke left that sexual orientation is completely non-malleable. I was informed by the left that if you are a straight woman, just as if you are a gay woman, you can't just switch and start having sex with people whom your biology does not attract you to. I mean, so which is it, Alyssa Milano? There's so many woke problems with this tweet. Also, it says, protect your vaginas, ladies. Ladies? What kind of cis-normative, heteronormative nonsense is this? Not all. Hey, lots of men have vaginas. Alyssa Milano. By the way, it's hilarious. Somebody actually tweeted that at her. So so, some woke person tweeted at her, not all ladies have vaginas. Some have penises. It's not hard to put cis before ladies, but you chose not to try. And that's transphobic behavior. And then Alyssa Milano tweeted back, you're right. If I could edit, I would. Thank you. Oh, the wokeness. So a man who says he's a woman is a real woman. So you can have sex, I guess, also with a traditional cis man, so long as he says that he is not cis. Right, so long as he is just a normal biological man who says he's so I guess Alyssa Milano has a way out. She just gets her husband to identify as a woman and then they're having lesbian sex and everything's cool. So I guess that, that, that provides an easy way out. But my favorite part, go back to the first tweet for a second. The first tweet where she says, our reproductive rights are being erased. Until women have legal control over our own bodies, we cannot risk pregnancy. Join me by not having sex until we get bodily autonomy back. Congratulations and welcome to traditional marriage, Alyssa Milano. Congratulations to you. So, as a virgin until marriage, a person who believes that it is moral to be abstinent until you are having sex with a person with whom you would not mind having a baby, welcome to my world, Alyssa Milano, where it turns out that if you don't want to, you know, produce a baby that you're going to kill in the womb, that maybe you shouldn't have sex with that person. It's hilarious. And she's seeing this, this is such a, it's such a negative. Until women can abort their babies again, they should only have sex with men with whom they are willing to have babies. Okay. Like, yeah, that was called marriage. That's called traditional sexual morality, where you don't screw people you're not willing to have a baby with. Sounds good to me. So I'm all for this. I'm I'm on board with the sex strike because you know what? Frankly, I don't care whether feminists like Alyssa Milano have sex. Makes no difference to me. Your choice, lady, has no impact on me. Second, if women are encouraged not to have sex until they are in a place where they are going to be comfortable with having a baby, Net societal win in a massive way. So I'm, I'm fully on board with hashtag sex strike. I think this is great. I think this is great. And I, I totally endorse it. I'm happy to jump on board. So sign me up for Alyssa Milano's mission to get feminists to stop having sex with men unless they are willing to get married to them and have a baby. You know who else is on board with that? Every traditional, morally, every traditional moral person. So that is pretty spectacular stuff.
uh, the left's self-ownership is, is quite pleasant on, on this particular issue. I've, I've truly enjoyed it. And, but it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. So yesterday, of course, was Mother's Day. And there's always a great irony on Mother's Day. I have a traditional joke that I always say on Mother's Day because the left is so perverse on issues related to gender. I have a traditional joke. It's so funny. People online are noticing that I tell this joke every Mother's and Father's Day. Yes. Yes, I do. Because I keep reinforcing the same point. You think I don't know that, guys? Of course I know it. What I always tweet on Mother's Day is happy legal guardian of unspecified gender day. Because according to the left, I am confused. A mother can be a man. A mother can be a woman. A mother can be anything. And as far as what actually constitutes a mother, I assume that you just mean a legal guardian. So yes, it is a joke. It is a joke upon those who are woke. Okay, so on Mother's Day, the left, which is promote, simultaneously promoting abortion, is tweeting out these very sweet photos of their own children. So Alyssa Milano, who's promoting, I'm not going to have sex until abortion is allowed, and also says that women should have sex apparently not with men, not with cis men, but with other women or transgender men or transgender women, I guess. She's tweeting out this very traditional photo. Happy Mother's Day. What an amazing gift it is to have these two wonders and prepare them for life and love. A very wise friend told me yesterday, we have a singular purpose on our short time on this planet, to love and be loved. I concur. I wish you all a beautiful day, unless you're an unborn baby. In that case, I hope they suck your brains into a sink. Because hell, that's a choice, ladies. Come on. All right, in a second, we'll get to more Mother's Day messages from the woke. But first, admit it, you think cybercrime is something that happens to other people. You might think no one wants your data or that hackers can't grab your passwords or credit card details. You would be wrong. Stealing data from unsuspecting people on public Wi-Fi, it's one of the simplest and cheapest ways for hackers to make money. When you leave your internet connection unencrypted, you may as well be writing your passwords and credit card numbers on a huge billboard for the rest of the world to see. That's why I decided to take action. To protect myself from cyber criminals, I use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. ExpressVPN has easy-to-use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, phone, and tablet. Turning on ExpressVPN protection, that only takes one click. Using ExpressVPN, I can safely surf on public Wi-Fi without being snooped on or having my personal data stolen. For less than 7 bucks a month, you can get the same ExpressVPN protection that I have. ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Ben for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Go check them out right now. Expressvpn.com slash Ben. No reason to expose your personal info to hackers. Make sure that you're protected. Expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Okay, so it wasn't just Alyssa Milano tweeting out, Happy Mother's Day. She also retweeted Kristen Gillibrand's tweet on mothers. So Kristen Gillibrand tweeted out, quote, to the mothers who have yet to be reunited with their children after being separated at the border, mothers whose children were taken by gun violence or illness, mothers who have lost a child or children who have lost their mothers, I'm holding you in my heart today and always. Which is nice, except for the Kristen Gillibrand is totally fine with late-term abortion. So apparently, I, I do love people who celebrate motherhood and also celebrate abortion. Celebrate it. And it's not, Leanna Wen, the head of Planned Parenthood did this routine. So she runs an organization that kills 300,000 unborn children a year. And she tweeted out a picture of herself with her kid and her husband. It says, as the mother of my beautiful 20-month-old son, I am proud to march for moms so that all our children grow up in a society that ensures healthcare is a fundamental right for all, not a privilege reserved only for some. Hashtag beyond Mother's Day. Well, if you want to ensure that health healthcare is a fundamental right for all, how about you include the baby in that? You're holding one. You're holding your own child. But according to you, if we reverse the clock 21 months, because that's a 20-month-old son, you reverse the clock 21 months, Totally kill that thing. Totally fine. And you know what? Just a choice. Just the way things ought to be. If you can't see the perverse morality of that, I, I don't know what to tell you because obviously that is a perversion. But the left has moved from safe, legal, and rare to abortion should be celebrated. Now we have Amanda Palmer, who is apparently a singer, songwriter, and performance artist. The LA Times has a long article about Amanda Palmer over the weekend says, Amanda Palmer never planned to release another album. She certainly didn't need to. Since 2012, the singer, songwriter, and performance artist has relied entirely on her fans to fund the piecemeal creation of her new work. Apparently, she grosses more than $100,000 a month from her nearly 15,000 Patreon subscribers. Income inequality alert, guys. But apparently, she needs to create a new album. Why? Because she is worried about abortion. Quote, 
Palmer also publishes an accompanying book, which is part memoir and part liner notes. It includes lyrics, stream of consciousness essays, and lush photos of the 43-year-old artist, sometimes nude and styled like a renaissance era goddess. It is already sold out on Palmer's website. A substantial part of her new show involves Palmer's three abortions, two in her 30s and one at age 17. Okay, don't tell me that you don't know how to use birth control. You're in your 30s and you had two abortions. If you are using abortion as a form of birth control, you are doing something deeply morally wrong. There's a deep evil to knowing better and producing a human life and then snuffing it out because you were too irresponsible to use birth control. She says, there was no part of me that woke up one morning and said, I know what would be great. I'll go out and sit on stage and talk graphically about my abortions. But the State of the Union seems to insist upon it. Palmer is referring to these scary six-week abortion bans signed into law this year in states including Ohio, Mississippi, and Georgia. She's offering abortion providers free tickets to her shows nationwide as an attempt to show support and normalize access to reproductive health care. The euphemisms here are astonishing. Normalizing access to reproductive health care? That means that she's going to champion abortion. She says the truth is really liberating. It's one thing to read it on the internet. It's another thing to sit in a room with someone and say, listen, this is how I felt when this happened. You are not alone and you are not crazy. Palmer says the political climate gave her the push she needed to make. There will be no intermission for which she began to entertain the idea about two years ago. It was a nerve wracking proposition for the one time front woman for the cabaret punk group Dresden Dolls. She would vowed to stay away from the shackles of the idiotic album cycle. But now she felt the necessity to do something. She said she figured that no one would pay attention to her and her political messaging about reproductive rights unless she played by the music industry's rules and released a full length album. I knew I'd only be able to get on the phone with someone from the LA Times if I put a record out. I know that's how it works. The tracks on the resulting album are so so dark that A Mother's Confession, a 10 minute plus song about Ash falling from a shelf Palmer placed him on as a baby, almost sounds comedic by comparison because she has a baby and put the baby on a shelf and the baby fell. And she says, at least the baby didn't die. She sings in the chorus. We were both into the idea this would be an unapologetic record of vulnerability. It was obvious to me this was not gonna be a commercial record. All that mattered was that John and I were going to try and make this record as beautiful and as honest as possible. She said, this is the weirdest thing I've ever done. It's like a stand-up show about abortion. Nothing quite says morality like a stand-up show about abortion. These are our moral betters. These are the people who should dictate which human life gets protected. These are the people we should respect when they give false stories about what exactly the abortion law does. And also the people we should respect when they pull their funding from the state of Georgia. I really think that people like Amanda Palmer Those are the people who I should trust when it comes to the protection of the unborn, when it comes to the protection of human life. Well, the woke scolds had themselves quite a weekend. Pretty incredible. Twitter has now apparently blocked, and then I guess unblocked after after some pressure. They blocked an expert PhD psychologist who helped write the official psychological position on transgender identity. On Saturday, Ray Blanchard, the PhD psychologist and adjunct professor at the University of Toronto, who served on the working group for gender dysphoria, which is the psychological condition, the mental disorder, as named by the DSM-5. In the the lexicon of mental disorders, gender dysphoria appears. It is, in fact, a mental disorder. When I say that folks suffer from gender dysphoria are suffering from a mental illness, this is what I mean. It is a disorder. It is labeled so by the DSM-5. This is an uncontroversial scientific position. But it is so controversial now And the left is so woke on this that they banned the guy who wrote the rules for the DSM-5, Ray Blanchard. (laughs) He tweeted out his clinically informed opinion on transgender identity. He still believes that sex change surgery is the best treatment for for carefully screened adult patients whose gender dysphoria has proven resistant to other forms of treatment, but he opposed treating children who may change their minds. And this got him blocked on Twitter. He said sex change surgery should not be considered for any patients until that patient has reached the age of 21 years and has lived for at least two years in the desired gender role. This is controversial because there are so many people on the woke left who, without any data to support them, want to give puberty blockers to children. He said sex cha- and, and he defended his rest- this restriction. He said gender dysphoria is not a sexual orientation. It is virtually always preceded or accompanied by an atypical sexual orientation in males, either homosexuality or autogynephilia. There are two main types of gender dysphoria in males, one associated with homosexuality, one associated with autogynephilia. Traditionally, the great bulk of female to male transsexuals have been homosexual in erotic object choice. This is all true, and this is why he ended up getting banned from Twitter temporarily. 
They blocked him on Twitter. Jesse Single, a contributing writer who happens to be honest at New York Magazine, I disagree with Jesse a lot, but at least he's an honest guy. He expressed his fear that as a journalist who often writes about science, he worries he will not be able to continue using Twitter. He says gender dysphoria is in the DSM-5. Despite endless rumor mongering and misinformation to the contrary, it is considered a mental disorder. Perhaps it shouldn't be, but it's beyond insane to suspend someone for expressing an opinion which lines up with the DSM. It is also true that the reason that it was relabeled gender dysphoria had nothing to do with science and everything to do with politics. He says, we are approaching a Soviet fundamentalist take your pick level of science denialism. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that the woke left is here to inform actual psychologists that they cannot use, you know, biologically correct terms. Pretty incredible. We'll get to more woke idiocy in just a second. First, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com and subscribe. For $9.99 a month, you can subscribe over at dailywire.com. When you do, you get the rest of this show live. You get the, the rest of the Andrew Clavin show live, the rest of the Michael Moll show live, the rest of the Matt Walsh show live. Matt had himself a weekend as well. Led a pro-life rally in Philadelphia, which was apparently huge. We'll talk to him later today on our radio show. We have two additional hours of this show every single day. We are providing tons of content, which is why you should join us. It's a lot of fun. We have lots of guests. We have good times, good humor, good drinks. That's good times. So go check that out right now for $9.99 a month. You also get, for $99 a year, this, the very greatest in beverage vessels, the leftist tears, hot or cold tumbler. Go check this out right now, constantly overflowing with the frustration of leftists. So you can go check that out right this very instant. It's join the group. Help us prevent ourselves from being deplatformed because the left obviously would like to do that, unfortunately. But go check us out right now. Also check us out at YouTube or iTunes. We are the second largest podcast in America by numbers. Make us number one by helping us at YouTube and iTunes. Go check us out right now. We're the largest conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Okay, other woke scoldery over the weekend. Apparently, Harvard just, the, the, it just let go its first black faculty deans. Why? Because these black faculty deans are doing the defense lawyering for Harvey Weinstein. So according to the New York Times, Harvard said on Saturday, a law professor representing Harvey Weinstein would not continue as faculty dean of an undergraduate house after his term ends on June 30th. The professor, Ronald Sullivan Jr., and his wife, Stephanie Robinson, who's a lecturer at the law school, have been the faculty deans of Winthrop House, one of Harvard's residential houses for undergrad students since 2009. They were the first black faculty deans in Harvard's history. But when Sullivan joined the defense team of Mr. Weinstein, the Hollywood producer in January, many students expressed dismay saying that his decision to represent a person accused of abusing women disqualified Mr. Sullivan from serving in a role of support and mentorship to students. Weinstein is scheduled to go on trial in September in Manhattan on rape and related charges. As the protests continued, with graffiti aimed at Mr. Sullivan appearing on a university building, Harvard administrators said they would conduct what they called the climate review of Winthrop House. In recent weeks, tensions have escalated with a student sit-in and a lawsuit sparked by a clash between one of the protest leaders and two Winthrop House staff members who are seen as supporting Mr. Sullivan. So these so-called snowflakes at Harvard were complaining because a lawyer was defending a client. So this is the way that it works. Now, as y'all know, I went to Harvard Law School. One of the more prominent professors there was Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz defended O.J. Simpson. Not only were there no protests at Harvard Law for years, ever, I was at an event where Alan Dershowitz personally auctioned off a signed exercise bicycle from O.J. Simpson. And no one cared. No one cared. He's a lawyer. You know what lawyers do? They often defend clients. And they often defend clients who are accused and are guilty. John Adams was famously one of the first Harvard Law students. And John Adams, or at least an early Harvard Law student, and John Adams defended the British in the Boston Massacre. I guess now this would get him kicked out of Harvard Law. When I talk about people who are snowflakes, what I mean is people who cannot handle an opposing philosophical or political position. And these folks who are snowflakes at Harvard who cannot handle somebody, I don't even agree. Harvey Weinstein's a piece of crap. He's an evil human being. But a lawyer defending him, that's not a reason to deplatform somebody at Harvard and go graffiti Winthrop House. The fact that Harvard caves to this is despicable. On Saturday, the dean of Harvard College Rekish Kurana sent an email to students and staff members at Winthrop House informing them he would not renew the appointments of Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Robinson as faculty deans after their terms end on June 30th. Mr. Kurana said in an email that his decision was informed by a number of considerations. Over the past few weeks, students and staff have continued to communicate concerns about the climate in Winthrop House to the college, he wrote. 
The concerns expressed have been serious and numerous. The actions that have been taken to improve the climate have been ineffective. The noticeable lack of faculty dean presence during critical moments has further deteriorated the climate in the House. I have concluded that the situation in the House is untenable. Okay, this is the heckler's veto. This is a bunch of people who were whining that Sullivan was being a lawyer and his wife was being a lawyer. And now they are being deplatformed from the, they're, they're being fired from a position effectively because they are acting as lawyers for somebody that people don't like. Pretty incredible. Sullivan and Robinson said, quote, we are surprised and dismayed by the action Harvard announced today. We believe the discussions we were having with a high level university representative were progressing in a positive manner, but Harvard unilaterally ended those talks. He says, we will now take some time to process Harvard's actions and consider our options. We are sorry that Harvard's actions and the controversy surrounding us has con contributed to the stress on Winthrop students at this already stressful time. The controversy highlighted a conflict between the legal principle that every accused person demands a vigorous defense and students' demands that college officials show support for victims of sexual assault. Whose side are you on, demanded one of the spray-painted messages directed at Mr. Sullivan earlier this year. This is mob rule. This truly is mob rule. We have a legal process for determining guilt and innocence in the country. A lawyer providing defense to a client is not an excuse for suggesting that, I mean, this is basically a lynch mob mentality, that you're going to go after the lawyer of a person that you want to see punished. And I want to see punished, and we all want to see punished, does not mean that the lawyer himself is doing something evil or wrong. I mean, this is, to, to cave to these sort of woke scolds is so bad for Harvard and so bad for typical liberals. You don't have to be a conservative to believe this. I am sure that both Sullivan and his wife, Robinson, I'm sure that both of them oppose me on politics thoroughly. I'm pretty confident of that. But that does not matter. The basic principle, which is that you don't get rid of people because they are acting as lawyers for somebody that you oppose, this is an astonishing thing. 52 professors at the law school signed a letter supporting Sullivan, saying his commitment to representing unpopular clients was fully consistent with his roles as law professor and faculty dean. At the same time, the dispute took on a racial element, with some saying that Sullivan was being treated Unfairly, the Harvard Black, Students, Black Law Students Association criticized the decision. Sullivan himself said that it may have been a racial thing. I doubt it's a racial thing. My guess is that it is, it is just a left thing. But the fact that this is even a controversy is pretty amazing. Okay, now we're going to get to the woke scolds in Congress. So again, it is amazing what the Democratic Party is willing to allow in Congress. The radicalization of the Democratic Party continues apace. So we have been told over and over and over again, that Mike Pence is an evil religious bigot, that his wife is an evil religious bigot for teaching at a traditional Christian school. We've been told that Catholics are bigots, that Orthodox Jews are bigots. We have been told that virtually everybody who happens to be traditional in their religious practices is, is a bigot, except if you are a radical Muslim. If you're a radical Muslim, then you are a, a minority that ought to be given all benefit of the doubt and not questioned at all about your convictions which is how you end up with Imam Omar Suleiman, the Akeen Institute for Islamic Research head, giving the invocation in Congress. I'm gonna tell you something about this Imam in one second. This Imam endorsed by the Democrats gave the invocation the other day. Peace, not war. Love, not hate. Benevolence, not greed. Unity, not division. And we commit ourselves to not betraying our prayers with actions that contradict them. Let us not be deterred by the hatred that has claimed the lives of innocent worshipers across the world, but emboldened by the love that gathered them together to remember you and gathered us together to remember them. May we honor one another, glorify you together. So this imam was invited to give the prayer by Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson. Now, the invitation itself by Democrats says something about the Democrats. He has every right to give the invitation, the invocation if he is invited. The fact that Democrats invited him is pretty phenomenal. The reason that it is phenomenal is because this guy happens to routinely give virulently anti-Israel statements. He referred to Israel as an apartheid state. He called for a violent Palestinian uprising. In 2014, according to the Washington Examiner, on his verified Facebook account, Suleiman called for another intifada. That would be a violent uprising against Israel. Usually that ends with the murder of innocents in Israel. For the first time since 1967, Masjid al-Aqsa is closed. The third intifada is near, inshallah meaning with Allah's will, hashtag free Palestine, Al-Aqsa under attack. Al-Aqsa was never under attack, of course. He constantly refers to Israel's military operations as massacres. In a July 2014 post, he posted a meme accusing Israel of carrying on genocide. 
Okay, it is not, in fact, a genocide. If there were a genocide taking place against the Palestinians, it is the least successful genocide in the history of the world, considering the radical increase in the number of Palestinians who are living in these territories. Suleiman, of course, has been a defender of Representative Ilhan Omar. He said, I'm not feeling the I know she said some hurtful stuff messages. She never accused American Jews of double loyalty or used anti -anti any, any anti-Semitic words, of course, which is a lie. And Omar, of course, retweeted Suleiman's invocation. The, the radicalism of the Democratic Party extends, of course, to Rashida Tlaib, who made a statement on a podcast the other day that is so astonishing in its radical dishonesty that it is worth talking about. So she said this, quote, there's always a kind of calming feeling. I tell folks when I think of the Holocaust, okay, well, that's always an interesting beginning to a sentence, a calming feeling, I tell folks when I think of the Holocaust and the tragedy of the Holocaust and the fact that it was my ancestors, Palestinians, who lost their land and some lost their lives, their livelihood, their human dignity, their existence in many ways, have been wiped out and some people's passports and just, of, and just all of it was in the name of trying to create a safe haven for Jews post the Holocaust, post the tragedy, the horrific persecution of Jews across the world at the time. I love the fact it was my ancestors that provided that right in many ways, but they did it in a way that took their human dignity away and it was forced on them. Okay, all of this is such a lie. <laughs> like all of it is a lie. So to suggest that the Jewish connection with the land of Israel is only post-Holocaust is simple nonsense. I mean, it's just nonsense. The Jewish, the Jewish presence in the land of Israel has been consistent for about 3,000 years. Also, the idea that Israel was created in the wake of the Holocaust because of the Holocaust is, again, simple nonsense. The Balfour Declaration in 1917, three decades preceding the Holocaust, the British government supported the establishment of a Jewish state in the area. The Arabs in the area rejected it. That Jewish state, by the way, was supposed to include Jordan as well. <coughs> in 1937, the British Peel Commission proposed a two-state solution. Also, this notion that the Palestinians were trying to provide a home for Jews not only is untrue, it is a blatant lie. The head of the Palestinians at that time was a man named Haj, uh, was, was a man named uh, Amin al-Husseini, okay, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Muhammad Amin al-Husseini. He met with Adolf Hitler. He was an ally of the Nazis. He specifically asked if Adolf Hitler would make the final solution applicable in the Middle East. He routinely incited violence against the Jews. He was one of the leaders of the Arab War against the Jews in 1948 at the establishment of the State of Israel. The official proclamation of the group led by Husseini said, quote, we appeal in the very midst of the onslaught launched against us now for months to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve peace. This is what, when the, the official proclamation of the State of Israel, rather, they said that they were asking for peace. They said they were asking for the Arab citizens to stay. They asked people not to flee their homes, not to take up arms. So every element of what Rashida Tlaib says here is just a lie. The, the notion that the Arabs provided a safe haven for Jews, they, they, were, they were bombing British targets and trying to murder Jews in an, in an attempt to keep the Jews out. One of the reasons that the British would not allow more Jews into Israel in the midst of the Holocaust was to please the, the Arabs who were living in the area at the time and were lobbying against it. So all of this is just a lie. Rashida Tlaib is a liar, but this, whenever you, whenever you quote her, this is very bad. You can't quote her. So she tweeted out, policing my words, twisting and turning them to ignite vile attacks on me will not work. All of you who are trying to silence me will fail miserably. Believe me, lady, I'm not trying to silence you. That's why I'm quoting you. She says, I'll never allow you to take my words out of context to push your racist and hateful agenda. The truth will always win. I agree the truth will always win, which is why people are quoting you, Rashida Tlaib. I mean, she's gonna, like, she can't explain any of that. The Democratic Party, of course, will ignore all of this. The good news is that she's not the only woke member of Congress. My favorite woke member of Congress over the weekend actually was AOC, as always. So the, the estimable AOC, intellectual heavyweight, she tweeted out over the weekend that we should tax the rich and then quoted, said, quote, when we say tax the rich, we mean nesting doll yacht rich, for-profit prison rich, Betsy DeVos student loan shark rich, trick the country into war rich, subsidizing workforce with food stamps rich, because that kind of rich is simply not good for society and it's like 10 people. So in other words, she means when we say taxing the rich, people I don't like. No way that goes wrong, giving the left the power to tax people that they politically disagree with and don't like. That is the essence of the rule of men, not law. That is the essence of tyranny. I don't like this person, therefore I'm going to tax them. It's not going to be an equally applicable law. It's just going to apply to Betsy DeVos. That's it. Man, the, 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 the left continues to grow more and more radical by the day. And it is a frightening prospect for sure. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that I like over the, over the weekend, uh, I had the opportunity to read a new book that is pretty fresh. I think it's out in the last month and a half or so by Tyler Cohen. The book is called Big Business, A Love Letter to an American Anti-Hero. And the book is really great. The book basically 
pushes the idea that big business is not, in fact, bad for America. And many of the lies told by critics of big business are just that. They are, in fact, lies. And that is true. It is true. The book is well worth the read. It goes through a lot of the myths told about big business, including the idea that they are monopolizing American industry, including the idea that CEOs are paid wildly too much, including the idea that big business is somehow worse qualitatively than small business, or that workers are treated worse by big business than small business. There are a lot of myths that get busted here. I don't agree with Tyler Cohen about everything, but there's a lot of stuff that I do agree with. The book is called Big Business, A Love Letter to an American Anti-Hero, worth reading at a time when big business is seriously under attack. Okay, time for a bevy of things that I hate. All righty, so apparently parents are naming their kids after Game of Thrones characters. Um, do not do this. Do not do this, particularly before you know how the plot's going to go. It turns out that there are a bunch of people who have been born in the last year named Khaleesi. Um, guys, did you see last night's episode? That's a bad move. There were a lot of bunch of people. There were a bunch of people who named their kid Dan, uh, Daenerys. Apparently, Arya um, is uh, about twenty five hundred people. Khaleesi five hundred sixty. Yara Greyjoy four hundred thirty four. Liana. So apparently it's a lot of women who are naming their girls. Like they're all girl names. Shay, you named really? You named your kid after a prostitute? Renly Baratheon, 102 people named their kids Renly. So they name their kids after a younger brother who doesn't have a claim to the throne and gets killed in season one. Apparently, 58 named their kids Tyrion. 30 named their kids Jorah. Eleven named their kids Gregor. Like after the I assume not the German name. They, Eleven named their kids Gregor after the mountain, who is one of the worst kid, one of the worst people. Fifteen people named their kid Ramsey, as in Ramsey Bolton, the worst character in Game of Thrones, most evil character in Game of Thrones. Fourteen named their kid Theon. How would you like to be that Theon? Hey, really, about f how long do you think it takes for the kid's nickname in Reek? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Really amazing that people, that, that, People are so stupid. As I say, the fact that 560 people named their kid Khaleesi is pretty fantastic. Okay, this leads to my review of the last episode of Game of Thrones. So, spoiler alert, if you have not watched the last episode of Game of Thrones, because it's the last season and it's a cultural phenomenon, I've basically been reviewing every episode. My reviews tend to cut against the grain. So, I was not a big fan of the Battle at Winterfell. It was shot through a potato, I couldn't see anything. And nobody of import died. But it's time for last night's episode. So, overall, I loved it. Overall, I really liked it. So I liked it because it was a return to the season one sensibility that life is random. People can get killed at any time. I also really like, I'm going to give you the things I like about it, and then I'll give you the things I hate about it. So the things that I liked about it, the portrayal of John and Tyrion is spot on. John has been acting like Ned Stark, like Rob Stark. He's been a Stark. The fact is, he knew he was the best guy for the throne. He decided to deliberately blind himself to that out of his self-interest at not being the guy who leads. And that cowardice led to a million people dying in King's Landing. Because Varys, as I said, was right. Varys, always the smartest guy on the show. And not only did Jon allow him to get fried, and this is a character shift for Jon. I mean, Jon's showing some serious cowardice here. Jon is the guy who put the, the king of the, who put the king beyond the wall, Mance Raider. He tried to save his life, and then he put him out of his misery when he was being executed. Okay, he did all of that because he thought that the killing of Mance Raider was actually a bad idea. John has consistently been against the killing of people who are potential allies. Varys is a potential ally. Okay, the fact that he goes along with Danny frying Varys is pretty telling of John, and the fact that he knows what Danny is after having seen that is pretty amazing. So John is not going to end up on the Iron Throne. The, mistake that, the mistakes that he's made are too grave. He cannot end up on the Iron Throne at this point, and that's great. Okay, Tyrion exposed as the total fool that he has been for several seasons now. Varys tells him what to do. Tyrion not only doesn't go along with it, he then rats on Varys to, to Daenerys, knowing what Daenerys is about to do and knowing that Jon has a better claim to the throne. And this is the episode after he made a specific appeal to Cersei's morality, which made no sense at all. Okay, so Tyrion is exposed as being a fool and he deserves exactly what is coming to him because that foolishness has consequences for the million people plus living in, in King's Landing. So that was the best part of the show. By the way, the person who is now the favorite to take the Iron Throne has got to be Sansa, right? She's the only person 
who has not committed some sort of grave moral sin here and also has been smart enough to understand what Danny was. Okay, now, the portrayal of Danny, here's my big problem. Everybody knew Danny was going to turn. They did obviously create the feeling that she was going to turn. And that was right. I mean, she had been abandoned by all her advisors. Many of her advisors were now attempting to stab her in the back. The ones who are loyal to her are now dead. All of that is perfectly fine. Her decision to nuke the city doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense because she's never seen the populations of the city in which she lives as enemies. And she's seen the slavers at enemies in Marine. She has seen the, she, even when the people basically turn on her, she doesn't loose the dragons to murder all the people. That's not something that she does. The fact that she turns on the people of King's Landing is, is not only a shock, it's, it's an unnecessary shock. Like she could have turned in a different way. Like for example, let's say that last night after the bells start to ring, she, the surrender has been had, she goes to the Red Keep and she nukes the Red Keep. Right? She takes care of, of Cersei, she kills Cersei, and, and, then, and she does so in such a brutal fashion that Arya and Jon decide they have to take her out. She tries to burn Jon out of anger. All that would have made sense. The fact that she nukes the entire city is never properly explained. You can see that Benioff and Weiss really don't have a great explanation for it. In the post shows talk about why she did that, they're like, well, in that moment, she sees that here's the place where her ancestors, that her ancestors built, and she's so mad and she's so alone that she decides to what, kill a bunch of children? It's never been in Danny's character. So you could have had her snap in a way that makes a little bit more sense. Like even, it makes even Cersei's blowing up of the temple small by comparison. So Danny doing this and becoming the, the most evil character in the entire series, which that is. I mean, no one else nukes the entire city. That is a turn that was unnecessary in order for her to be enough of a threat that she had to be gotten rid of, for example. And that was a problem. So now we've gotten to the stuff I don't like. Uh, the, the move to have... Jamie basically become what he was the beginning of season one. And then the battle with Euron Greyjoy is completely worthless. There is no reason that Euron has to fight Jamie. That is nothing, any, that's not even fan service. Nobody was looking for that. Euron could have been burned on the boat. Everybody wouldn't be fine with that. By the way, speaking of the burning of the city, the buildup to two of her dragons get taken down and the third is just invincible. Why are they only firing one arrow at the dragon at a time? Weren't they firing hundreds of arrows at the dragon at the time, the bolts at the dragon? Like, why wouldn't they do that? It doesn't make a lot of sense to make it come to be so anticlimactic that she just nukes the city with no opposition whatsoever, with one dragon, is a pretty astonishing move. And I understand they wanted to do the unexpected, but it's so abrupt that you end up with this giant buildup and then an ex effectively a giant letdown. You'd expect Cersei to put up some sort of resistance. Um, so that was, so in any case, back to the Euron Jamie thing. The Euron Jamie fight, completely unnecessary. Euron is a crap character, he's always been a crap character. <laughs> so. The fact that he's the guy who stabs Jamie makes no sense. And then the fact that Jamie basically walks off to killing wounds. He's just kind of strolling around afterward. You didn't need that battle. Let's just say that Jamie gets into the Red Keep, finds Cersei, and they both die in the, in the basement, basically. Why did he need to be wound, wounded by Euron? Euron didn't need a send-off. No one cared what happened to Euron. He's just going to go back and work at Zara's anyway. Who cares? So that's the, you know, so that, that, that I thought, the twist on Jamie, I didn't think was great. You know, I think everybody kind of wanted the moment where Jamie realized what Cersei was instead of him just going back to her. And then her finally being vulnerable at the end of the show is again, I thought, a, a weird move. So the Jamie Cersei kind of full circle thing wasn't a huge fan of that. I know everybody was into Clegane Bowl, but honestly, not uh, not into Clegane Bowl. The only the best part of Clegane Bowl is just when uh, when Cersei's hand just gets wiped off the map in one second. That part's the best part. But the, but the whole, he's a zombie, I'm going to jump into the fire. Okay, fine. I understand fan service and all that. Clegane Bowl 2019. So, but overall, overall, the idea that Arya is helpless in the face of the dragon, good. The idea that Jon and Tyrion made a huge mistake, good. The fact that Danny loses it and that she turns, good. So, I'm much more pleased at this season of Game of Thrones than I was at the, than I was at the last season. My predictions for the final episode, I think that Arya is now going to have to sneak in and try to kill Danny. I think Arya will die. I think they've kept her along for, alive for too long. She doesn't have a story arc beyond the, beyond the show. Um, so if they have guts, they will kill Arya, which probably means they'll keep her alive. But Jon cannot end up as king. Danny will die. Tyrion has to pay some price for being a, sh a, a terrible advisor. <laughs> and so I think that the most likely scenario at this point is Sansa. So Sansa coming, riding in on the outside. And that makes sense because the entire sensibility of the show 
is Sansa's sensibility, which is moving from this fantasy world where everything works out great to being the cynical leader necessary to do all of this. By the way, I thought that Danny's turn was played well specifically until she nuked the city because she had turned from this aspirational leader into a hardcore leader. Like, it, it makes sense from her perspective. Nuking Varys makes perfect sense from her perspective. Her saying to Tyrion, listen, I'm not going to lose the city just to lose the city just for the sake of humanity. That makes sense from her perspective. It's evil, but it makes sense from her perspective, obviously. So all of it makes sense except for nuking the city, which is a, a step too far. All righty. So I think with that review of Game of Thrones, we can end the show. We'll be back here later today for two more hours, or we'll see you here tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hey everyone, I'm Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. Alyssa Milano is staging a sex strike to protest anti-abortion bills. But of course, if you're on a sex strike, you're not going to need an abortion, so the problem is solved. You know, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to the Constitution, when it comes to free speech, conservatives are talking about principle, but all the left wants is power. We will talk about it on The Andrew Claven Show. I'm Andrew Claven. <laughs> 